This is the definitive music publishing video I've been waiting to make for over a year on this channel. We have talked about music publishing in different things and licensing and things like that. But today we're going to speak with an actual music publisher on Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee, who's going to help us really define music publishing. We're going to talk about everything from copyright. What is copyright? When is it necessarily to file? Should we be copywriting everything before we license stuff? Music publishing. What is music publishing? My definition, his definition. What does it mean to be published? What about licensing? What about sheet music? What is the music publishing industry about and how can it make us music income? We're going to talk about PROs. We're going to talk about live gigs and income from that. We're going to talk about classical music and how still that can bring income from classical music performances. We're going to talk about the MLC. What the heck is the MLC? We're going to talk about sound exchange. We're going to talk about content ID. We are going to cover everything on music publishing with someone who works in music publishing all day long professionally on Music Row in Nashville. So you better get you a nice warm beverage because here we go. Mm. If you're new to this channel and just wanted to come find out about music publishing, make sure you're going to make music income dot com slash free. I've got a free course about Pond5 if you're interested in the whole stock music thing. I've got an ebook called 50 Ways to Make Music Income that might just help you get to the next place in your music career. And there's other things that are there and more stuff that I am working on right now to put in this free section. So make sure you check out makemusicincome.com slash free. You'll find the link down in the description of the video. All right, let's get to the interview and talk about publishing. Well, everyone, I am so happy to be joined here by Trevor Matheson from Word Music and Curb Music. Is that right? Yeah, Would you Curb say Word you're still with now. those? We Curb mashed, Word yeah. Entertainment all mashed up. And mm -hmm. uh, Trevor, mm -hmm. and they are still on Music Row in Nashville, just like the old days. We right? are. We are. We are on Music Row right across from RCA Studio B. Well, I want to just jump right in because you know I have a bunch of questions to, to talk to you about. And I want to make sure that I get Great. to everything and kind of just, I want to lay out publishing today. I mean, I want to really just lay it out plain and clear so that people who from around the world who are asking me in my Discord, when do I need to get a copyright? What, what, how do I get my music published? You know, um, PRO yeah. questions. What is the MLC? Should I deal with it? What is sound exchange? Yep. Should I deal with it? What mm -hmm. is content ID? Should I deal with it? And so all these things uh, I want to touch on. So let's start at the very beginning. Let's start with copyright. This is a question you answer a billion times uh, mm -hmm. a day, probably, or at least uh, when you ever go to conventions or things like that to talk. But my explanation to people when they ask, what is copyright and should I copyright my songs? I'm like, well, if you are putting them down in some kind of form and putting them up online, you're basically, you can put copyright and the year on there because you have basically put it in a physical form. But it gets a little bit more uh, official if you file it with the copyright office. What's your, what's your take on that? Is that about right? You're, you're right on, exactly. So if you write a song today and you write the lyrics down on a sheet of paper, you, take, you record a work tape on your iPhone, essentially you have a copyright. Um, that belongs to you. It's in some sort of tangible medium um, that you put the music or the, the intellectual property down onto. Now, you, like you mentioned, you can register it with the copyright uh, office. Um, you do not have to do that. And there's no timeline on that. You can do it 20 years from the date that you wrote the song. You do have to have it registered at the copyright aid, uh, uh, office if you want to try to enter into any litigation. If you think somebody stole your song, um, you think somebody ripped you off um, in order for you to do anything legally and enter into any infringement suit of any kind, you do have to have that copyright registered at the copyright office. But yeah, you're right. Any sort of tangible medium, whether it's on a CD, on your computer, on a jump drive, seat, seat of, uh, sheet of paper, it is essentially copyrighted. 
I, and I think I've heard you say this in um, some things we've done before where we're trying to explain this to people. Even that doesn't necessarily completely protect you because someone could always file a copyright uh, with, mm -hmm. they could register a copyright before you do, and then it's still exactly. just he said, she said, and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. But in, in my background, I and I've been through this with a lot of independent artists, mostly on the independent side, of course, but um, I've never seen on that side too much of like he, he said, she said about who wrote a song and that kind of stuff. I just don't see it that often. No, no, we, 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 we don't either. And you don't, you don't see it a ton until you really, until the music is really getting a lot of visibility and a lot of listenership. That's when you can kind of run into, Oh, wait a minute. That, that verse sounds more like mine. If it's just somebody in their, their living room and, and it's, there's not, it's not out on a bunch of mediums. It's just not, the likelihood of there being, like you're saying, he said, she said, going on, it's very small. But really, when we hear about it, it's Robin Thicke and Pharrell, or it's, you know, George exactly. Harrison, and it's huge, huge exactly. stars. Songs that are, that are generating hundreds of millions of streams and downloads and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Totally. So um, as far as when it is necessity to file, when, when someone works with you and you publish uh, their songs through, you guys do that? right away or do you do it down the line or yeah so uh as a publishing company um we have a number of writers signed to us and i believe our uh, lady in copyright department will uh register the songs in bulk mm -hmm. i think quarterly mm -hmm. i think she kind of sends in songs quarterly mm -hmm. uh, it's cheaper to yeah. register songs uh in bulk rather than one at a time i think it's like 35 bucks per song or something but then you get a reduced rate when you send them in in a bunch so i think we're doing it about quarterly okay. um and so she just saves it up all the songs that, that get entered into our royalty system i think she can kind of send them out um, i'm not sure exactly what kind of file she uses but she's got to send a recording as well you know if there is one but it, it, at the very minimum title writers percentages all that kind of stuff how much is do you know how many songs you can put in that bunch is, it, is there a limit that's a good question i don't know i don't know how many well um, i i tell writers and uh, i don't do this myself necessarily but i do tell writers that um <clears throat> if they are concerned about it go ahead and register whenever yeah. you feel like it if it's a concern to you sure. register maybe yearly i mean what are you going to write mm -hmm. 25 exactly. to 50 songs a, a year or right. less probably mm -hmm. go ahead and just register yearly if that makes mm -hmm. you feel better and makes you sleep better at night. Yeah. That's solid advice. When it comes to licensing, how does that, how does that same, same deal? You just, whatever you're, you're working on and licensing the same deal quarterly, you're just licensing all those things. Or let's say I license this to a BMG library and that library is going to essentially become the publisher because they're going to take the publishing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I have several of these deals. Um, is there a risk or a, a downside of you having it copyrighted personally for them or do they, can they go in and change the copyright or is there, are they going to any knowledge? About uh, that? And you know, as, as the copyright owner, you have the ability to do whatever you want. So if you've already copywritten your, your own material, but then down the road, you want to sign a, a deal with some sort of publishing company or record label or whatever you you own it, so you have the freedom to you can change assign it. At it to them. Yeah, you can assign over a percentage of, of that to a, a company. Now, we, I'm like part of a company, so I, I'm kind of on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So often when we talk about licensing, we are fielding the licensing requests from others most of the time. Right. Most of the time, people are coming to us and saying, hey, can we use this song on for this artist or for this uh, television series or for this commercial and then, then we will execute the licensing documentation to give them permission to do so. But we are also licensing songs for all the songs that our own artists are releasing. Mm -hmm. So they're releasing a song that is not 100% written by our artist, which almost all the time is the case because most songs are co-written by multiple people. Mm -hmm. Then we are licensing for that portion that isn't ours from the other companies who do own that. So every time we're releasing a product, some sort of, whether it's a single, an EP, a full length record, we are licensing those songs from the other companies if we don't wholly own them. 
And we do that as we, we actually have, I think music services handles it for us for all our non-commercial. And so we do a lot of that. They do a lot of that stuff as it comes out. They, we send them all the information and they reach out and uh, license all those works for us. Cool. And, and, but still those will have been likely copywritten uh exactly. because you do it every quarter so that's all yep. taken care of already. yeah so as you know as writers are turning in songs and we find out yep this is going to be a cut on an upcoming project of some sort we go ahead and get that in our system we register it i know we're going to cover pros later yep. we register it at the pro um ask at bmi csac etc and- let's move on to music publishing proper and what a music publishing company is or what a music publisher does. And my definition is always that they are the company who is basically um, working the song. So you come to them with a song and let's say it's not an artist that you are representing, but just a a songwriter. And you say, we really like your songs. And they say, we, I'm really happy you like my songs. And, and then you say, we'd like to like sign your songs and have you write for us my definition of what a music publishing company does then, which is it's not much from than a music licensing company, an exclusive library that I work with, where the deal is um, I, be, I keep all the writer, 100% of the writer royalties, and they keep 100% of the publishing royalties. So basically we split it 50-50. But with a publish, music publishing deal that you sign with people, um, I assume you do one-offs, but you also do yearly deals? Correct. Yeah, we'll do one-offs. We call them single song deals. So, if, uh, and generally, they're they are manufactured. Those songs are manufactured out of some sort of co-write that we help set up. Mm-hmm. So, if we have a stable of writers, and we're like, and that's like what you're saying, uh, we are working on behalf of our writers and those songs. And, and in a lot of ways, we're a rights management company. And if you are not signed to a publisher, like you were saying earlier, you are essentially the publisher. So you are in control of managing the rights that you own with those songs. So that's what we're doing. And all those single song deals come out of co-writing sessions that we have set up with our co-writers or artists and other people, maybe who aren't signed, but maybe are kind of like generating a lot of buzz and they're getting in all the right circles. And, and so because if they're not affiliated with a company at the time, because we were the impetus for setting up that co-writing session, we might say, hey, we think we can find a home for this song if you would trust us to to kind of amplify the reach of this song. We're open to you know signing a deal of one song deal for this song, and it may be 100% publishing like you're talking about. Whereas we take all the publishing, we administrate it, or we might split the publishing. So maybe you um currently are unsigned. We might split the publishing 50-50, maybe 75-25. But like you said, you always keep the whole writer's share. We don't, we don't do deals where we're dipping into the writer's share. So when, <laughs> cause a lot of people have come to me and said, what does it mean to be published? And I'm like, you act like there's a machine that you walk into Nashville with and you feed it right. into the machine and it comes back ding, and you've got like a little <laughs> seal on it. I got my song yes. published. And yes. my, my definition of what, what it means to have a song published is, is it doing work? Is it out there making any kind of income? If you put it up on even a stock music library and it's making you, and I know people who literally make thousands of dollars per month uh, by through stock uh, libraries, um, higher end ones, but um, they are, they, I call that publishing because they are, they are acting as a person getting out there and pushing that song and making money with it. And so that song is basically, um, kind of published, would you say? I mean, in that in that way, hundred percent, hundred percent agree. If you boil it down to, um, yeah, you're published. If that song is generating income, and if you're you know, working with uh, an entity such as Cardboard Entertainment or whoever else is out there, you just like you said, you want them to be working for you, not just sitting back, taking a portion of the publishing adding a song to their catalog and just kind of sitting on it. It needs to be a proactive approach to amplifying the reach of that song. Hey, can we find new uses for it? Um, can we, because of this song, can we help you get into other writer rooms or, and then the administration side, like, Hey, we're going to handle all the administration stuff, royalty statements, making sure um, all the money gets to the right place and, 
Um, that's a headache that a lot of people, especially creatives who might not have an administrative bone in their body, uh, don't want to have to think about. You know, and so administration, there are administration only deals. So if you're like, you know what, I want to keep my publishing, but I'm going to give you 10 to 15 percent just to administrate this song or this catalog so that I don't have to think about all that. Those exist as well. And so you're, you're right. It's 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 helping uh, you're published when that song is generating income or you have something somebody working on behalf of that song or catalog. And just as an example of what a publisher does, uh, I will contact Trevor uh, from time to time and say, I have an artist who needs songs and she wants up-tempo girl songs that are about empowerment or something like that. And Trevor will go into the catalog of songs he has at Word and, um, and send me five to 10 songs that they've got in the catalog that kind of fit this. I assume you have them filed away with various keywords and all that kind of stuff so you can go through and find those. And then he will literally send me uh, these songs to, to, uh, to show my artists and if the artist picks one, then <clears throat> they can use it. And that, that kind of thing is, is a publisher, uh, or Trevor in this case, being proactive. Well, actually it's the producer being proactive saying, hey, I need a song, but it's the publisher saying, I can help you, here are some songs. Yeah. So I really appreciate all that over the years. That's been, I mean, there oh. these aren't generating lots of money for Word or or Curb because no. you know they're indie artists, but still. Uh, but I will tell you, it's fun when you do that um, because increasingly, and I know we're going to get to some things the way things have changed and in, in coming up, but increasingly, finding homes for songs. It, there's very few artists that are just taking outside songs, yeah. meaning they didn't write on it. So meaning like you coming to me and asking for songs that you guys didn't even write on, that that happens very seldom, especially in the Christian space. It still happens in the country space. You'll still have pitch meetings where uh, publishers will get together to pitch for a specific artist. Uh, but increasingly, because of reduced revenues in other areas of the business, artists want to own that publishing or at least own some of that song. So it's all about figuring out how can we get a co-write with that artist or a co-write with the producer who's working with that artist so that we can get a cut on that record. So anytime there's an opportunity to just pitch songs from our catalog, um, there are a select few artists in the CCM Christian space that will do that. That's always fun for us because we're like, oh, OK, we can kind of put our creative hat on and be like, I love this song, this vibe. I think it could be produced this way. It'd be perfect for that artist. So it's fun for us. I guess that probably is across the board uh, in folk or in uh, hip hop or whatever. They're, the people making it are usually writing it. Um, yeah. Everybody in the room uh, making the beat and making the rap and everything in a hip hop session oh, yeah. is is in on the writing, yeah. you know? Yeah, so and hip hop, hip hop and pop and R&B stuff like that. You'll have people dividing up, you know, 3.5% on this, uh, like because of the beat and it gets crazy. Like we usually operate in CCM and country on even splits, yeah. but in some genres, it doesn't, it doesn't get uh, split up like quite that easy. I always think of, of publishing as something that has pretty much stayed the same from CDs, or before CDs, through the CD time, after CDs into and into the darker days where it got a little lean, right? After mm -hmm. the CD stopped stopped selling and, and it was only yeah. downloads, before the Spotify age where that's helped get things kind of back on track for the music yeah. industry. But still, I've always thought that the publishing industry really hasn't changed all that much, except for the fact that, well, of what you're just talking about. And I guess that's the most dramatic thing. We don't have Whitney Houston's anymore we have singer songwriters. That's uh, true. Essentially, you still have the same types of licenses. Uh, you have to uh, you have to equate and flex for new mediums like streaming, TikTok, different different platforms. People are trying to figure out how to monetize those things. So in that way the industry is changing, but still at the end you are a rights management company and you're you're trying to figure out how to how to monetize those things and whether it's mechanical sync performance royalties, all that kind of stuff. Those things haven't changed. Um, and, and the model, like you're illustrating CDs to downloads to streaming, it's changed from an ownership model of where I own this CD to an access model. I have access because I have an Apple Music membership 
to every song in the world. <laughs> and I can just click a button and I can listen to it. Um, so it's access rather than ownership. So that's the, some of the bigger changes, but essentially we're still doing the same things as a publishing company. And licensing is part of that. What part of licensing, what, what percentage of what you guys do is licensing these days, would you say? I mean, we get lots of licensing requests. I wouldn't say it's probably the majority of what we do. Yeah, but uh, is it 25%, 10%? Uh, it, it's probably around the 25% mark, I would imagine. We are collaborating with other publishers and other companies, so we don't own everything that we're releasing, so we have to license that, that stuff that we're not. Um, where people, like I said, most of the time people are coming to us to try to license songs in our catalog, but it's the, the administration uh, and legal departments are spending a lot of their time licensing uh, our songs because it's the, the way we um, can make money, but then we also have to pay other publishers what they're due as well. So I noticed on RIAA, uh, the final 2021 stats where they show 80% is streaming and 10% and is CDs and whatever and vinyl, you know, and then. But yeah. there's 2% that's listed as sync, which I think yeah. is interesting that that's even listed, but I think that's yeah. going to grow over the no years. Doubt. No doubt. I mean, you think about all the new, just the new visual medium that's coming out, whether it's Netflix or Amazon Prime or all those different streaming services for, for video. Or meta. Anything that's got, yeah, exactly. And all, and all the music. I mean, spend one spend spend one hour watching your favorite show, and every time something musical oh happens, think of the like. That's all licensed. That's yes. all. There's somebody who's in charge of that show. They are the music supervisor for that show or that movie or whatever, and they're having to license those songs. So that it, you're right. It might say two percent. It might seem like a small percentage um, of the overall music business, but it's very important. And the cool thing, and we might get to it later, is that it's negotiable the rights are negotiable it's not set by a statutory rate like the mechanical and performance rights are it is set by the marketplace so it's hey it's, it's you, you can negotiate all right this movie's a bigger movie it might have more reach it might be a bigger studio so we're going to up the rate a little bit more for, for something like that so so uh, all right let's let's talk real quickly i just did a video a few weeks ago about sheet music um s still a thing um still a thing. print music is still a thing still a thing we so at curb word uh we were i was essentially first at word entertainment curb purchased us in 2016 and 2016 we had a print division of our company which primarily dealt with like choral projects kids choir um projects mm -hmm. christmas um uh, things for for churches and and special events and things of that nature. That part of the business got carved out when we were purchased in 2016. So we essentially don't have a print division anymore, okay. but we still have a catalog that we own mm -hmm. that is in a lot of those print um, choral octavos, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So we still own a lot of it, that, and people still want to try to. Hey, this is out of print. I can't find it anywhere. Can I just photocopy it? Well, no, you're not really supposed to just photocopy <laughs> it. You do have to pay that license. Um, but it's not as long as there's like churches and symphonies and orchestras and and some of that. That that it is going to be a, a piece of the business now. COVID, oh man, COVID really hurt, uh, especially a lot of the, the, the Christian sheet music industry because all, all the churches were closed. Yeah. So you had choirs shutting down. Nobody was, you know. You weren't doing the big Christmas uh, uh, yeah. events, and so that really hurt the print business. I know several went, you know, had to go bankrupt and all that kind of stuff. But it is bouncing back, and as long as these churches do exist, there's going to be a need for sheet music. Let's shift to PROs now and talk about performance rights organizations. And we're not going to uh, really hit this over the head because most people know yeah. what these are. Um, these are places that collect your uh, performance royalties. But I don't think people fully understand all the performance royalties that they collect. Obviously, when I used to think of PROs, all I thought about was radio, because mm -hmm. I, I, at one time, there was this thing called radio that we put music out to, and it used <laughs> to pay a lot. And uh, yeah. that has kind of, I mean, it's not gone, but it's... No, nope, not gone, still there. And I know to you guys, at the, on the label side, radio is still probably a very viable and discover, mm -hmm. a discovery tool. In, in It is. 
I mean, every time I especially, talk to labels and I think radio's dead, you're like, oh no. <laughs> it's not, and especially, and I primarily work in Christian music. It's it's very important in Christian music. Mm -hmm. um, so I, where, I expect country our probably too. demographic is and how yeah. people are discovering new music, it's still, there's a large part of that pie that's still attributed to radio. And country, I would imagine as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. sir. Some of those, some of those heartland type of uh, genres. Yeah. So, um, you guys uh, have a BMI ASCAP and CSAC uh, headquarters there. Um, we do. Uh, CSAC is invite only. How does that work? That's one question that I've been wanting to to know. I mean, how does CSAC? Do you apply to them, or or, or yeah, did they come find online, you? Yeah, there's there's a. Most of them, I think, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, all have online portals now that you can go on yep. to register. And um, you go in and say you want to set up a new publishing company name. Um, and But then you're probably going to have to list, you know, how many songs you have, like how often do you play shows or mm -hmm. that kind of thing, just so that it's you're being vetted, you know, sort of. From my seat, when we have a, uh, if we're helping uh, one of our writers set up a new uh, publishing name at a PRO, we're usually making the introduction for them. And then when we're making the introduction for them, that that in and of itself gives credence to them right. as a writer and sure. an artist. So, so they're like, okay, yeah, sure. And they might forego the registration fee or, or whatever. Sometimes there's a fee involved. It's not uh, with BMI as, not as with a BMI, writer, but, maybe as a publisher right. with BMI. I think as a like, publisher there yeah. is. Yeah. But they might forego that if I'm making the, you know, Hey, so-and-so is moving from CSAC to BMI. Um, can you help set them up? And they're, Oh yeah, absolutely. And they'll wave some of that and kind of usher them along their way. Obviously a lot of the people watching this uh, channel are concerned with, the PRO money from television um, plays yep. for licensing, but also anything else that might that might play. Mm -hmm. uh, while film doesn't pay PROs here in the states, it does around the world, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Are you are yep. you up that's, on that that's, kind of that's thing? That's my understanding as well. Yeah, and then you think about you're in a, a mall somewhere, and the music that's going on the speakers, or mm -hmm. any event, you know, concert venues, or any of that. I had a buddy who was working at ASCAP and his main job was to cold call event spaces to see if they had a blanket license already set up with ASCAP. So, and basically letting them know, hey, if you have music being performed in your venue and you don't have an existing license with us or the other PROs, you're essentially in violation of those, those copyrights. You're uh, not paying what is due to them. So he would have to politely say, hey, you need to sign up for this, and here's why. And Don't they uh, have so to yeah. report? Do they have to report yeah, they, what was played? And Yeah, then you got to report um, you know, every time there's a set list. Now, a lot of times, so like our artists go out and they play a, a venue. The manager for that artist is usually the one keeping track of the set list and then sending that into the PROs to say, hey, we played these songs at this this venue space where this many people there, that kind of thing. And then... Uh, the PRO, whichever PRO that artist or writer is with, pays out royalties commensurate with um, with those stipulations. I do know that classical is a whole different deal. Classical is a whole separate classification. You actually have to reapply as a classical composer on top of being a regular BMI writer because it's it, it's a different. It's those venues that they they collect from. And those venues are way more, and probably, you know, arenas like Bridgestone, they they probably have somebody who is reporting yeah. all that stuff, especially since they're down the, literally down the street from you. Oh, and sure. they, yeah. they have to make sure that they are reporting that. But Rupp Arena or any place that's a, a large concert place has someone likely who is responsible for reporting Correct. who's there and yep. all that. In yeah. the same way, I had a classical performance at uh, the Dr. Phillips Center, which is our version of the Schirmerhorn, kind of re uh, classical music uh, center here in Orlando. And um, before I did that, I was told to make sure I registered with uh, BMI as a classical composer and uh, and made sure I reported those, those, or I didn't even have to report it. The Dr. Phillips Center reported that to BMI. And that was 75 bucks for writers and 75 bucks for publishing, you know, for wow. just one 15 minute performance. So they don't call them performance rights organizations for nothing. 
Exactly. They literally are <laughs> after performance rights they and are. performance and pay you for performances. And I've heard of bands that they when they, when if they're a heavy touring band, they are reporting everywhere they are playing. So that's something to think yeah. about. Live gigs is is a way to make money from PROs and not just the way a lot of people watching this channel think, oh, I'm gonna make PROs money if I get out on, on CSI this week or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. It could be from other things like gigs and classical works and things. All right, so let's move into mechanical royalties a little bit here and talk about what they are, which um, how would you best explain mechanical royalties to people? We've talked about performance royalties. Now we're talking about mechanical royalties. Yeah, so mechanicals are royalties that are based on when it, if it's recorded on a CD, uh, streaming um, from Spotify, um, it's that when somebody wants to record your song, they got to pay you a mechanical royalty rate for that song. Um, and uh, we've been dealing with uh, a statutory rate that's been set for a long time at 9.1 cents for every you know, CD mm -hmm. that's sold or every uh, streaming is fractions of a penny. I think it's gotcha. like six pennies for every hundred streams or something. Yes, like I that. see that yeah. on my statements. Yeah. So or on my um, Spotify statements or whatever. Right. So it's that it's that, that royalty that is collected for uh, recording uh, somebody's uh, song that they've written their copyright using their copyright and recording it. But as a publisher, we are definitely pushing for those royalty rates to come up. Thankfully, we had the Music Modernization Act in 2018. That's really kind of helped things a lot with the advent of the MLC um, and and pushing these royalty rates up a little bit. You know, as minuscule as they are, each little bit helps. Let's just talk about the MLC, which is the Mechanical Licensing Collective, and they um, really started up in about what last year, sometime. Yeah, to the beginning of 2021 is when they started to. I've been paid by them very yeah, little, yeah. but I've been paid by them and uh, and followed put my catalog in there and all that kind of stuff. It collects, if I'm not wrong, the mechanicals from from streaming services only. Is that correct? That's correct. Streaming only. So we're not talking about CDs, any of they're not doing performance um, anywhere else. It is strictly on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, all those streaming services. The interactive ones. Mm -hmm. So where you can go and specifically play one song or skip a song or listen to the whole record, you're in control of what you want to hear. That's what they're monetizing and collecting for. So we've yep. talked about this MLC collecting the interactive streaming, which means I can go to Spotify and listen to my favorite album that just came yep. out. And I want to listen to it. But yep. if I go to, um, there's also non-interactive streaming, which mm -hmm. if I go to Pandora or if I go mm -hmm. to iHeartRadio or if I go to, as far as I know, iHeartRadio, right? Yep. And right. then of course the biggie, Sirius XM. Sirius XM. Yep. That's yep. all collected by Sound Exchange, correct? Correct. Yep. So they are Sound Exchange is in charge of collecting everything on all the non-interactive satellite, non-terrestrial radio. So basically, like just like you can't control a radio, what a radio station is playing, um, you can kind of go into Pandora and say, "I like this type of music," but you're going to get, you know, different artists in, interwoven in there, and it might skip around. You can't listen to the whole record, all that kind of stuff. You don't control it, so it's non-interactive, and that's what Sound Exchange is is collecting on. Yeah. Um, so we have another um, collecting process now, which we didn't used to have, and I call it the PRO of YouTube, which is Content ID. We have a place, a way that music, if it's not owned by the person who's putting the video up, um, this content ID is collecting on the backside of these of of these YouTube videos, and I know they are because I am currently with a company called Identify, um, and they um, are watching. You know, they are. They're literally owned by a company called Hawk, but they're watching like a hawk all these videos <laughs> that aren't monetized and paying me if my music is on it or splitting up between me and whoever else has music on it. So what part of Content ID, are you guys involved with that at all? Are you guys monitoring that at all there? Yeah, we have we have parts of our company that are monitoring that. I specifically, that's not part of my world and my day-to-day, -day, um, but I know we are 
where smaller companies, so there's other companies that I know of that might have a, a team of five to 10 people where that's all they do. They're just working with YouTube. They're just working with, you know, figuring out, like you're saying, how to monetize and capture. Now, YouTube, they're, they've got great software where a lot of it is generated. The software itself can mm -hmm. catch all right, that's that master that belongs to this they company. They can catch melodies without yeah. even. Yeah, and as long as you as a company have an account set up that's monetized and you have your information in there, it can be it can recognize it. Um, so we have a smaller team of people who are interested in that. But yeah, it's it's it is on our radar and it is something that we are interested in and in continuing to figure out how we can maximize and capture that income because it's substantial. There's a lot of people who that's youtube and those those types of places that's the only place they go to for music mm -hmm. um yeah uh, it's which, become amazing yeah, music because they want to watch the lyric video at the same time or they want to watch the music video um yeah. so um yeah super important well man thank you so much for your time um it, it, you, your Eric. your uh continued help and and information is just always so valuable and appreciate appreciate you and everything you do yeah i know you do great work and um thanks You're for being kind. part of this channel and being and, and giving us this information because this is the this is the video i'm going to mark push everything back to when someone says in some conversation <laughs> well, what is a pro but what does copyright <laughs> actually do i'm going to say <laughs> i've got the video the definitive video that we uh, did on this and I'm this is going to be I'm that so one. so happy i could be a part of it with you all right, man. Well, I hope to see you sometime when I'm in Nashville again, or if you're ever down here on vacation or anything, make sure you lock me up. Well, I'll be down in the something. Orlando area next week for the Experience Worship Conference. Dude, so we should be down together. There. Okay, yeah. cool. So, thanks so much. Well, Appreciate it. Thanks again, man. We'll talk right. to you soon. And uh, yeah, let's get together sometime. Sounds great. Take care. Thank you.